Great. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, our webinar today. Uh, my colleague Oscar Jefferson is just dialing in to do some of the initial presentation, but just to say we're delighted to have Croydon Council on the webinar this morning. They're going to be talking about how uh, they use data to try and make a difference to the lives of people in Croydon. Uh, it's great to have um, it's great to have them on here. We've, we've been working with Croydon for a long time. Uh, Julia Pitt is our is our main speaker, and Julia, I believe you've got um, a couple of your team with you. Yes, I do. I have um, Paul Garlick, who is my enablement service manager, and I have Anita Conchat, community resources delivery lead. I thought it would be useful for them to be part of the webinar, as um, so many of the people wanted to understand how things are done on the front line. Fantastic. Uh, Paul, Anita, great to have you on here. I'll give you a moment to, to say hello a bit later on so we know who's speaking when and, and your voices uh, too. Before we get started, it's always helpful to have a bit of an audio check. So I can see uh, the attendees that are on here. If um, if on the on your sort of panel on the right hand side, you can put up. You, there's a way to put up your hands. So if you just have a go and you can hear me okay, and you put up your hands, great. A few of you are saying yes. So you can all hear me okay. That's fantastic. Um, one of the things, partly because we've got um, Julia. Paul and Anita on. There'll be we're, we're going to have leave try and leave extra time for questions. So please do ask those questions because from the the feedback uh, from those registering, you're particularly interested in just understanding how to make a difference on the front line. We're going to have two polls uh, as part of the webinar and a survey at the end, which um, which will be served automatically. We are inter interested in your feedback and in particular on what you'd like us to cover in future webinars. And we're aiming to finish by 11.30 at the latest. So delighted you can all hear me. On the right hand panel, you can still put up your hands, but also ask questions as well. So as we're going through, if you type them in, either myself or Oscar will collect those and ask those at the end. Uh, the three speakers today, so is myself, Devon. Um, uh, I'll say a little bit about myself in a second. We've got Julia. Um, Julia, do you want to say a bit more about yourself and let um, Anita and Paul say hello as well? Okay, um, so I'm Julia Pitt and I'm the Director of Gateway Services here at Croydon Council. Um, I've been Director here since um, January 2018 and prior to that was um, Head of um, Gateway Service Delivery from 2015. I've got um, a long history working for by the central government and local government, um, far too many years for me to own up to, to be honest. So I'll hand over to Paul. <laughs> Good morning, uh, a service enablement manager, Gateway Department at Croydon. Um, wealth of experience, around 20 years of experience working in the welfare benefit system um, for local authorities. Great. Hello, Great. Anita Contact Community Resources Delivery Manager. Um, I lead on a lot of the work around taking our gateway approach out into the community, and I, my background is sort of 10, 12 years of regeneration and um, community development. Great. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Anita. Paul, it's interesting, just as you were saying that, I was remembering we first started working together when you were in Sutton. So it does make a, you know, you've sort of seen it in, across a few different local authorities. And Anita, we've had, uh, yeah, we've been together at various events, usually celebrating um, Croydon's success at various awards. Uh, and that is some of what we're going to be, uh, Julia's going to be talking about today in her part of the presentation. Oscar, have you managed to join us by any chance? Um, I do, can you hear me, Devon? Yeah, I can. Excellent, Oscar. Um, I can I can hear the audio, Devon, but uh, there's I think you're going to have to uh, guide the presentation for us today, if that's all right. No problem, no problem at all. Uh, Oscar's joining us. He's joined as an account manager recently, um, and this is his his first webinar. Um, so yeah, do welcome welcome him. Uh, and Oscar might be asking some of the questions as they come up uh, as well toward the end. So do keep those coming. The agenda's three bullet points. We're going to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the case for prevention, and I'll start with a video that um, Julia's team at Croydon made. It's only two minutes long, but I think it's a good way to connect with um, why we're all on this webinar. Then Julia's going to talk a bit about the the Gateway approach, um, which has been nominated for a number of awards. We're going to be joining you at the MJ Awards uh, in a couple of weeks' time, Julia, which is uh, it's great to be able to support you there. But I think it's probably interesting for other people to know. 
what you, what's effectively why why that's been why the gateway approach has been so successful. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of three ways in which Croydon have used data to make a difference. And Paul, uh, in particular, because I know we've worked closely on the data together, you might have a few words to say uh, about a little bit of that as well. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to start by serving a poll. Uh, and it's quite an interesting one. You should be able to see it now. Uh, how is Universal Credit doing? <laughs> uh, it's quite a broad question. Uh, and you can just uh, answer one of the three following questions. So you can either select that it's doing, uh, it's, it's in the context of how the media tend to report universal credit. So do you think it's doing better than media reports suggest? Do you think it's doing about the same as media reports suggest? Or do you think it's doing much worse than media reports suggest? Uh, and Julia, Anita, I'll ask you to comment on that as well when we've got the, got the poll results in. Uh, about half of you have voted, so I'll just give you another few seconds um, before I before I share the results. And actually, before I share the results, actually, what what would you say, Julia? Would you say, or uh, Julia, Paul, Anita? Would you say how is Universal Credit doing? Do you think it's doing better than reports suggest? About the same or worse? That's quite quite a wide context. I would say it's doing better. Than reports suggest, but only because the whole wraparound service that local authorities are having to get involved with, and not just local authorities, third sectors as well. So I think if it wasn't for that, I think it would be a lot, lot worse than what I suggest. So I think it's being propped up by a lot of services. That's great. Well, we've had almost all of you vote, so I've just closed the poll. Um, it's quite an interesting set of results. So 17% would would agree with you and say it's doing better than reports suggest. 48% say it's doing about the same as reports suggest. I mean, this is a context of, of quite negative reports, uh, I suppose, is, is the point. And therefore, what's most interesting to me is that 34% think, think it's even worse than uh, media reports suggest. And sometimes it's interesting to see who, who who's answering, because sometimes it depends on, on what customers you tend to see. So, for example, really? I've done this one. Sorry, go on, Julia. Sorry, Devon, I was going to say that it can also depend on your own organisation and your own organisation's approach to it or the local authority that you're working with because if you haven't actually altered and transformed your services to try to mitigate the impacts of universal credit, then of course locally things would be worse than reports suggest. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think it's going to be interesting to, again, for you to share a little bit more about how Gateway are doing that. Anita, did you have anything to say? Because I know you're at the food stop sometimes and you set, sort of tend to see some of these impacts on the front line. I think only, yeah, I mean, Julia was mentioning about the, the, the various services and we'll go through in detail, but I think it's making a huge difference here in Croydon in terms of you know, the frontline work and taking our gateway approach out into the community um, and we're delivering some, some great outcomes as a result of that specific piece of work. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like it's, the, from what you're saying, it sounds like it's the support people get when things go wrong. That, uh, that that's making the difference. Um, yeah. Okay, well, um, moving on, I, I'm just going to share this video that, um, I need to figure out how to do it, actually, hopefully it works, great, uh, that Croydon put together. It's only a couple of minutes long. in seven thousand pounds rent arrears and um i didn't know what to do about it i got myself into some debt which i couldn't get out of so easily and also i had a death in the family gateway nicola they got involved they got a conference meeting held and um she fighted my case she fighted it and fighted it and I, I've got to keep staying in my house. If it wasn't for Gateway, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be. I would be homeless. My kids would not be at school. And I don't know where I'd be in life, to be honest. I really don't. Before Gateway Link got involved, our situation was quite a tough one, to be honest. We moved into this house, um, had two extra children come in, not enough room with the 
Thankfully, we had some Gary Link helping us. We managed to get it all. Well, it's not all done, but we're we're getting there. My two boys were living with their mum, and they got taken off of her and put into social care. And then I had to fight to to get them back out through the courts, both with their own special needs as well. So we've had to have a new part of our house built with adaptions for them. To be reunited and have these adaptions done, it's just meant the world. Um, we can live a normal life without all the upheaval we had from a few years ago. And the gateway officers, in our opinion, just took the time to listen to our needs and actually take action on them. It's just like always making contact with us because with some council departments in previous years, you'll make contact with me and other things like before you hit them again. It's just regular contact, regular checkups, always updating, always asking what we need and what they can do. It's been no end of help. Really powerful. Uh, and I think it's just important to bring those those voices from the front line. Thanks so much for sharing that video with us, uh, Julie and the team. Uh, and one thing I sort of take away from what they said was just the, the proactivity around the support that they got. Um, are this Is there anything you want to sort of add to that before I hand over to, I, I was just going to zoom out and talk a little bit about some of the implications for that and a broader policy perspective before handing over to you, Julia. But is there anything you wanted to say kind of off the bat on, on the implications for some of the families in Croydon of your approach? Um, I don't think, I think well, I'll cover in my, my presentation. Um, I think right. the video speaks for itself and, and what the residents are saying. Um, and as I, I go through my presentation, I'll be talking about the gateway approach um, and what, how and why that makes such a difference to um, our most vulnerable residents' lives. Great. Well, I think a really helpful and engaging way to to kind of um, remind us all what we're what we're all kind of here to talk about. I mean, I just wanted to zoom out before handing over to you, Julia, to talk about the need for proactive and preventative activity, which I know is the philosophy behind um, a lot of what what Gateway does. Um, so I've got a link here. I, I was on the the Sheila Fogarty show on LBC a little while ago. I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, you don't always go enjoy doing media appearances, but Sheila actually gave us a little bit of time. To talk about some of the issues around um, universal credit. Hi, hi Devon. Um, sorry, yep. just to interrupt you there. Um, we're still seeing the uh, poll results. Um, so if you could just click um, uh, back to the presentation. Sorry, sorry to um, interrupt you there. Oh, sorry about that. Did you see the? Did you see the video? Uh, no, we we had the audio then, but we, we we weren't able to see it. But we're we're back we're back now. So uh, that's uh, that's good. I'm so sorry, uh, listeners. Um, we can, uh, w if we get time, we'll play it again in a bit. But um, I think you got the gist from the from the audio there. Um, I wanted to sort of zoom out a little bit. Uh, there's a there's a link here on on the webinar which you'll be able to click on uh, later on when you download the slides of uh, a small piece we did on the Sheila Fogarty show. She gave us a little bit of time to talk about this about the UN report on, on uh, the recent UN report on the impact of, of poverty. And I think the three points to make here, I think people are struggling for lots of reasons, partly due to kind of um, what support is available or not, as the case may be locally. Uh, fundamentally, I think it's the impact of austerity. People are struggling with um, not, having, not having money to sort of make ends meet a lot of the time. Uh, I think sometimes it's about uh, being able to understand who's struggling more than others, and also understand the root causes and the knock-on consequences. So the drivers behind preventative work, which I got to talk about a little bit there, and you, you heard in the video, um, was you know a, a lady who was sort of quite severely in debt. Well, that has knock-on consequences for her children, uh, her health outcomes, uh, the, the, the need for housing, and to prevent homelessness. And if you're not doing, if you're not sort of investing in support up front, you tend to pay for it at the bottom end, and I think that's that's a real big part of what's been um, what what again has been some of the philosophy behind Gateway. Um, I'm sharing with you as well the Universal Credit Roadmap. It's worthwhile saying Universal Credit. There are about two million people on Universal Credit as of I think this week. Uh, DWP were tweeting about that earlier. 
Uh, a lot of the talk is around managed migration, which uh, there's a pilot kicking off in Harrogate, and I'll be at the DWP stakeholder event on Thursday to learn a little bit more about that. But through natural migration, there's still a lot of people moving on to Universal Credit each day, so around 130,000 people each month. And there are still a few changes uh, expected, so uh, additional run-ons for JSA, IS, uh, and, and ESA expected um, next year some changes to deduction rates so some of these changes that you'd want some some of which you'd want moved to have moved forward uh, are coming in and this roadmap which you can download says when they tell lets you know when they're all coming in uh, what changes are coming in when so you can download that afterwards uh, and before handing over to julia i just wanted to say a few words on why we love working with croydon so much so uh We've had a long relationship. Uh, Croydon were one of the first uh, clients to support our uh, analytics, which you'll see a bit later on, the Lyft dashboard, uh, letting us um, effectively giving us the space to invest in using data effectively, because I think uh, the gateway service in general was just very interested in um, both being better at targeting people, but also showing the impact that it was having. So we've had a long relationship. I think the gateway approach of bringing services together is fantastic. It's been uh, duplicated across many other councils we work with since. And some of the reasons we love working with, with Julia and, uh, and Paula and Anita as well, I mean, they're just wonderful people, very practice oriented, which I think is what they're going to talk a bit about and just very focused on making a difference. Oh, so Devon. <laughs> so, thanks, Julia. I mean, the the... The point is, and this is just very genuine, sometimes when you're working with data and analysis, you can present uh, quite a lot of, uh, you know, interesting reports and other things. And some of the main reasons we love working with Croydon is that you use that data to make a difference in people's lives. And without that extra step you guys take, we might as well not be doing what we're doing. So that's fundamentally why we love working with Croydon. Without further ado, Julia, I'm going to hand over to you if you're not blushing too much uh, and, and to talk a bit about the gateway approach. Yeah, it's a good job people can't see us, isn't it, really? Yeah, it was one of those blush moments. Um, thank you, Devon. Um, so if you can see in front of you, there's this image, and um, this is an image of really that depicts what the gateway approach is, is all about, really. And if we think about all of us, each and every one of us, if one pillar were to be removed or one pillar was to be destabilised, be that our work, our home, our income, somehow our foundations become a bit rocky and things start to fall apart and quite quickly so, um, which really means that if we can't help people to stabilise the foundations of their lives quickly and help people to help themselves, then they are more likely that they're going to enter into our statutory services. Um, and I think this, this picture really does show it for us in terms of our approach. And of course, as uh, people who will know me, is the big can-do, because we are um, a service which has a real can-do culture and actually thinking outside of the box to actually get solutions um, for our most vulnerable residents. So um, Gateway was originated really back um, in 2015 and was put together in response to welfare reform. Um, we needed to find a way to prevent households who um, were going to be experiencing crisis um, not to rely on statutory services. So what we did was actually look at how we could bring services together that weren't naturally together in the local authority structure to try to provide a service that was more about whole family rather than dealing with individual parts of the issues. We looked at how we could better support residents in crisis and we, we then brought a variety of services together, to a variety of services together. Um, sorry about that guys, we just got interrupted in the room, so I, I, I do apologise there. That's fine. Um, and, um, so what we did was look at um, bringing um, independence for the whole family by working with residents, developing individual action, budget plans, and building that into business as usual, and but building it at scale, and moving it towards a single front door for targeted residents. And I use the words targeted because targeting is absolutely critical to, the, to our approach. 
because what we do is it's it's not around a universal offer it is about supporting those at most in in need so the first step for us in developing the approach was actually we, we use data sets to analyze demand identifying crossover residents um, across 10 different services with multiple touch points and we found that two-thirds of the residents um, appeared across two or more services and then what we did was the further segmentation of these residents um, by total cost and debt to the council was undertaken and we also did mapping of residents journeys linking it to emergency accommodation and social care and this helped us in redesigning the new business processes so what did we do first and foremost so we've got got an image here gateway phase one we brought together housing needs and assessments emergency accommodation welfare rights financial support and employment and training services to provide residents with an integrated journey through council services and really establishing a single front door via a wide-ranging initial assessment of the resident situation gateway phase two broadened the approach to include working much more closely with social care practitioners providing a joined up offer and a single point of contact for vulnerable adults and families who were requiring multiple interventions um, and some of that really did focus around those foundations of life that we talked about earlier around income maximization around employment support around linkages with community and as part of that we developed um, a new team and a new team was born which was called Gateway Link. Gateway Link are a group of, of officers who work alongside social care practitioners to join the dots where they couldn't be joined before and to try to prevent our most vulnerable residents from falling down in between the cracks of services and, and, and assessments. For many people don't actually meet the thresholds for early help or for social care so but they are still in need of assistance when it comes to things that we provide within gateway in particular assistance around welfare around housing solutions around homelessness prevention and we were able to assist in in in, in this effort in in the phase three as well what we also did was actually to push our model out into the community um, so working alongside the community targeting areas with high levels of need um, so the areas that we we targeted were um, were in the high levels of um, deprivation but also um, we used data to identify where we had a large population of residents who were impacted by welfare reform and whereby if they were not assisted for example families who were benefit capped would more than certainly be entering into our front door um, around our homelessness issue, issues. If you could move beyond, Devon, to the next slide. Sure. Thank you. This slide here gives you a little bit more information around some of the outcomes that Gateway has achieved in, in, in the last year um, and around the way that we approach things. So I've talked about all, around already the wraparound support that we provide. We provide community-based services. Importantly, we're working with our partners. And that doesn't mean that we're doing it to our partners. We are working alongside our partners in the voluntary community and faith sector. And indeed, our second hub that we're opening um, is actually alongside um, one of our faith sector partners um, in the north of the borough. And we, we are working from their, from their asset in partnership with them and it is absolutely fantastic because it's breathing new life into into their area as well the other thing we do is the employment support and and what we're aiming for is to try to enable families and Julia, adults to Wait. be to have long-term Okay, um, to the right there you can see the, the table um, there which demonstrates some of the um, things that Gateway has um, really helped around. Um, you can see at the bottom um, that there, we've actually um, if you like, developed a social lettings agency in Croydon um, and we're actually, the numbers are higher now, but in a year we worked with 86 landlords 
and placed 41 households um, with a very small number of staff operating that. This is a pilot initiative, um, which is great. And the part of that is trying to help around the prevention and intervention agenda and working with some of our most vulnerable residents, providing things like tenant training, but also a place where landlords feel safe, safe that they are, are actually um, renting their property to someone and there is always someone that they can come back to for assistance um, around our um, model, which obviously is around the income maximisation, the employment support, but importantly, being there if there are problems when, when, they, when they arise for the landlords. There's also another couple of figures there which are really key, and that is that we've supported 542 residents into employment or work placements and helped 58 to maintain their employment. As many of the listeners to this cast will know, that for many people, um, the only way out of universal credit is employment. And so to assist um, those residents into employment has enabled those families to actually move on to a new journey and a new chapter in their lives. If you can move us on to the next slide. This here is a diagram which actually demonstrates what um, Gateway is all around. And it was interesting to hear what Devon was talking about, about his um, radio interview. Because really, the crux of what Gateway is all around is around mitigating the impact of poverty. And that may be poverty due to um, welfare reform, poverty due to relationship breakdown and the imbalance that that brings to a family. It could be poverty as a result of somebody losing their, their, their job. It could be poverty as a result of somebody losing their good health. It could be poverty as a result of people not having a place to call home and being unable to afford um, the rent within the private rented sector. And in, in the middle there, what we're talking around are the circles which we bring as part of our services to try to assist um, our residents to become in, in to a better place so we work around financial support we're working around child, child poverty and well-being and also debt management budgeting etc um, if you move me on to the next slide Devon Again. Hello. Again. Okay. Can you move me on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so this slide here gives you some information around how we use the data. Data has been absolutely critical to how Croydon has adopted its approach in targeting families, particularly around the work that we've been doing within the localities. So I'm going to talk you through how we've done this and what it's actually meant in action, because I think that's how, how these things are, are better explained. So when we were developing our approach out into the community, the first thing we did was to look at data for um, one of the areas, as I've already mentioned, which was a deprived area in Croydon. We looked at that data and then we wanted to have some, some more information. So looking at data that was held from Croydon, from Croydon Council, DWP and Policy and Practice, we um, identified a range of families who we would be able to target from within that area, who if we were una weren't able to do anything with them, were more likely and had high probability of hitting our statutory services. And if I were to say to you that if we were not able to help some of these families, who had built up massive rent arrears, what would happen to them? They would come through our front door, and in the main, my belief is that they would have been found intentionally homeless. And if they were found intentionally homeless, then of course the duty is different, and therefore the impact on a local authority would therefore fall greatly on children's social care or adult social care. So you had to come up with a different model. And so the model was that we'd use the data, we'd analyze it, we'd identify the cohort, and then what we did was to develop an initiative working alongside the community and the voluntary sector within the area. 
and as part of that developed a partnership based on the ethos that what we wanted to do in that area was to help people to help themselves to be the best that they could be to actually try to ensure that the foundations of people's lives were as strong as they could be and so what we did was use that data and do targeted intervention that targeted intervention led to my officers not just sending letters not just sending texts no we know that doesn't work either well some of these families whose heads were deeply in the sand what they needed was the personal touch they needed the doors knocking they needed uh, people to be able to come to an asset where they felt comfortable not to have to come to a council building and so that is what we did we identified the, the top 100 families who needed assistance and began the journey of Community Connect and the birth of the Community Food Stop. We started to hold community surgeries, developed an employment support club and a job support club, as well as providing personal budgeting and welfare rights support. Also within that partnership, we developed community events, um, but not with us taking the lead. You see, it was important for us that what we were developing was actually a sustainable model and one whereby um, key partnerships could be built. If you could move me on to the next slide, Devon. This here demonstrates um, how we've used the business intelligence um, to actually map the areas of high risk in terms of debt and those affected by welfare reform and deprivation. We also looked at barriers um, as to where the city centre, if you like, transport to get to us in, in, in the city centre, I call it a city centre, it's a town really, but it's a big town, um, and look at what needs where we're local to that area. As a result of the success of the Community Connect and Food Stop in um, the area of New Addington Fieldway, we're now moving into our second area. And you can see at the top of the um, picture there, there's a huge intensity and that is where the north of the borough and that is where i am pleased to say that we have moved into partnership with the parchment methodist church in thornton heath and we've, we've we're working alongside the, the volunteers um, to actually work from the church to provide employment support personal budgeting support and again we are using that data in the same way as i described before we're using that to analyse the people who are most in need and then doing a targeted approach to try to ensure that we're helping people who are most at risk of becoming homeless or from entering into other statutory services. And so, for, and as a result of that, we are really going to be helping more and more residents to become independent, but most importantly, to, to prevent families from unnecessary touches into statutory services. Can you move me on to the next one? Sure. Ooh. Okay, I thought I had another slide there, but of course, of course I don't. I'll just talk a little bit more about the Community Connect and the, the food stop, because I know people would be really interested in that, um, what we've, we've developed there. Um, when we went to New Addington Fieldway, as I mentioned, we were working with partners and one of the big issues for that particular area and indeed the second area that we're going to and probably every other area where there is severe poverty was the fact that food poverty was at an all time high. Food banks um, across the country are, um, more, are in more demand than ever before. But what we wanted to do was to develop a new model a model that restored pride, a model that restored faith, and a model that not only helped people, but it helped people to, if you like, achieve their aspirations and not to be sustained in the life that they were living. Because when you're talking to people and people were having their individual action plans developed, rather than them being talked to as, you know, you can do this, it was, what is it that you want to be doing? So we developed um, a, um, a new business model in partnership with Fair Share, the organisation that distributes edible waste, whereby people would create, become a member of a, uh, a scheme and um, they would become a member of a scheme which would enable them to pay £3.50 per week for approximately £20 worth of 
food, which would also um, enable them to have um, individual action plans, access to personal budgeting support, debt advice, um, employment support, childcare, health checks, including immunisation, um, and a vast array of other services coming in to assist them. As part of the development of this membership, we also developed a local collection point. And the local collection point enabled a wide range of the voluntary and community sector to become members, whereby they could also get food at a very cheap rate to help them to run things like lunch clubs, after school clubs. And indeed, one of the schools now provides free breakfast for all year nine students which is really important because any of you guys listening who've got year nine um, young men in their homes or no year nines, they get really hungry. And if they're hungry, they can sometimes get angry. I know we use that term at home as hanger. Um, so that's really helping um, the wider community. So this whole approach around the Community Connect, the Community Food Stop, the Alliance, is not help, just helping this cohort of residents that we identified, but is having far wider impact and helping us grow our partnerships and develop opportunities um, for our residents. So I think I'll close there, Devon, around, around this, but I suppose on my, my final um, word would be to say that data is key to enabling us to target those families that we, we know could potentially be hitting crisis point. And without it, we would be working in the dark. So thanks for the help with the data, Devon. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, just to say, we are getting a few questions in. Uh, the vast majority of them were, we can't see the video, can you close the poll? Uh, but there are a couple of uh, substantive ones uh, now as well. I'll, I'll, and if I get time at the end, I will replay that video for those of you to, to see it. But there are a couple of substantive ones as well. Um, the, before I go on to those, perhaps, I think it's probably worthwhile. Um, uh, Paul, Anita, I'm not sure whether there's anything else you wanted to add. Anita, I know um, Jade joined you at the, at the food stop one day, and there's a nice um, sort of case study of that on our website. Uh, in a blog post. Yeah, you, so Jade, Jade came out. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, no, Jade came out and, and joined us um, for a day and, and helped out in the shop and kind of really got a feel for, for how we kind of work with residents and, and what we do in the community asset. Um, and indeed, just recently, I'm, I'm liaising with some other members of your team because they'd like to come out and do the same. So we're really pleased that, um, yeah, policy and practice are continuing to, to sort of support our work in the community. Fantastic. And for those of you that are on the webinar as well, if you'd like to take advantage of that, we're always keen to get some of our uh, analysts as the team grows out there uh, making a difference uh, in practice as well. So if you'd like to have one of the Pippers come join you for a, a few days, uh, we do make a bit of a difference, particularly if you're working with our services as well, because you get the, the training benefits of, of that as well. Um, there's one other poll uh, which is probably worthwhile launching. So, how the, the question is, what would you, what would help you to improve your own prevention work, particularly in the context of having heard some of what Julia was talking about? So, I've just distributed the poll now. The options are, what would help you to improve your own prevention work? Is it about having better access to data internally across departments? Is it about having better access to data from from DWP? Uh, particularly for those on universal credit? Is it about having better relationships internally uh, across departments? Is it about having better relationships with partners and stakeholders and those in the community? I was interested to hear about the relationship with, with the church in the new area where you're, where you're launching, Julia. Is it fundamentally, is this actually just an issue around money? Is it about having better budgets to be able to fund your work, uh, to be able to be more preventative? And how much is that the, the core issue? While we're waiting for people to complete the poll, most of you, were just over half of you have completed. I think there's one sort of question, perhaps, um, Paul, Julia, you might have sort of something to say about this, but how did you get all of the different departments on board with this data-led journey, uh, kind of working across the piece? Um, was it was it easy? <laughs> did, it, did the nothing kind of... Easy, wake up from top down? No, nothing in it is easy. 
Um, I think, um, you know, as you guys listening, you know, this is a new department. This um, gateway was developed in 2015, and a lot of um, the, the, the of us, you know, the work that we've been doing has been really about us demonstrating that we um, have a return on our investment, you know, and that through the work that we do, that we prevent that escalation, we prevent people from hitting other services, which become are more costly. And so, albeit that what we're, we're, what we're doing is, and for, for, you know, and those from the bottom of my heart, I believe what we're doing is the right thing. We have to demonstrate that what we are doing not only is the right thing for our most vulnerable residents, but actually that the the local authority is um, who is also is subject to austerity measures, is not going to be in a worse off position, and that actually we will be preventing costs in other areas. So demonstrating that impact from your activity to to preventing costs downstream has been key to Gateway, and has been. I'll, I'll talk a bit about how. One of the ways in which we've we've helped you to look at that in a moment. Just actually, one other thing to comment on: uh, by some distance, the like forty six percent of those what would help you to improve your own prevention work is better access to data from DWP. Would you agree with that? I know we've talked quite a lot about universal credit data, uh, the extent to which that exists, um, and the extent to which you can access it, which has improved, I would say, in the recent months from DWP in a, in a couple of ways. But kind of, how important do you think that wider working with DWP's data is to the future of Gateway? Yeah, that was Paul here. Um, yeah, for me, massively, I mean, I was just, we were just talking amongst ourselves here, I said, where we are in our journey, you know, ours would be better access to data from DWP because we feel we're quite, you know, we're there with most of the other ones. And obviously for us as well, we've got around about 27,000 residents um, in Croydon on UC. So it's the big unknown for us. You know, anyone that works in benefits, you know, we get money each year to work with Bencap. You know, residents are affected by Bencap, and yet we're not really told which ones are affected by Bencap if you're on UC, you know. So we've had to sort of be creative and have permanent presence down in the job centre. So as someone is affected by it, they can almost say to me, you might want to go and speak to these colleagues next to us. But it shouldn't have to be that way. There's so much more we could do with the data, certainly across services in terms of education, social services. Um, I've spoken to you many times, Dan, as well. The DWP is yeah. their data, and I always yeah. argue with them it's not their data, it's the residents' data. You know, GDPR, they have a massive section now on consent. Um, I think it's time we all start challenging it that it's not, they can't hide behind that. It's the fact that systems can't deliver it to us, and I think that's where we really need to challenge it because GDPR does allow us. And there's, you, know, you can see 46% of people say it's the, you know, it's the biggest thing that they need, but I all would agree it would help. I also raised, I've raised it at a number of um, events and places where I have been having to give evidence um, and um, lobbying for better access to the data. And indeed, I think it was 10 days ago, I met the director for London and the South East and I emphasised again the need for better access to data from DWP and that to enable us to move forward on the journey and to enable us to be more proactive than what we already are and to enable us to target that this is essential for us going forward. Great. Um, I mean, there are a couple of really interesting questions coming in, some partly related to that, some partly related to other decisions by DWP recently. Before um, moving on to those, I think it's probably worthwhile just bringing to life some of what you're talking about, Julia. So um, I'm just going to talk a bit about three ways briefly uh, in which Croydon are using data to make a difference. So I'm just going to come out of the presentation uh, now and hopefully you can see uh, a view of Croydon. So effectively you have this image on one of your slides. So um, just about to reload. And going back to the household finances screen uh, and then the street level view you'll be able to see uh, some of the data that you had in your slides. I can see a few more questions coming in. Do, do keep them coming in. Um, and I'm going to sort of talk a bit about, should we talk a bit about New Addington? Is that one of the areas where you wanted to, where you focused a little while yeah, ago, if I remember right? Talk about Thornton Heath, it's up to you. Okay, so I'll just show you how you might drill down. So one of the questions that's come up actually is how do you work with sort of bite, bite sized chunks when you've got such a large group of people. So if I click on here in the ward uh, area, if I sort of... Devon, 
Sorry? They're about the bite size. Obviously, so I talk through how we deal with the bite size. We literally just yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, in terms of, you see, the, the tool that's in front of you there, that's the tool that we use. And obviously, literally, we can drill down to all data. So, you know, we can literally just go down to Fulton Heath. But it's not just Fulton Heath, it's the north of it. Yeah. But we sort of looked at the whole area. There's around about um, residents in the north of the borough that needed help and that were affected by welfare reforms, even medium, um, small, or you know, large. But from that, this tool is really useful to sort of break down. Then you can look at the ones that are um, households with children. Um, you can look at the ones that are unemployed. And so what we've done from that 2,000, I think it's about 2,700, we've drawn it down to 200 families that be going to be the first ones that are contacted. So these are households that are with children, unemployed, affected by medium or long-term um, welfare reforms, and are in debt with us. So that was the starting block. And I said, that's where Julie mentioned the fact that we're already contacting these. We ring them, we email, we door knock. We try every sort of solution to say, listen, everything that we've got in front of us tells us you're struggling. Come and speak to us. This is the services we can help you with. This is what we can do. This is our vision. It's all driven by themselves. And that's how we sort of get the buy-in. That's fantastic. And you can see as you've been talking through, I've drilled down to the 76 households in Thornton Heath with children that aren't working that uh, currently owe council tax arrears to the council and have been affected yeah, by yeah. a welfare reform. So arguably yeah, might be struggling. That would be, yeah, that would be 76 to 200 families. We, we brought it out to the other sort of wards as well. But in Thornton Heath, that would be the 76 that we're contacting first. Yeah. And, and how does that contact work? So when do you, how do you sort of go out to sort of make that connection and what happens when, yeah, yeah kind of if you sort of describe that interaction, because often it's, it's the sort of outreach work, we often get councils to this point where they see the value in the data, but it's the actual outreach work that I think is obviously what makes the difference. And how have you gotten your teams to sort of get to that point? Where they're so we basically, I use this data, I download it and obviously from this data we get the benefit reference and then we get a report one of all the contact details that we hold for the families. Um, and then it literally is, you know, if you've got a telephone number, we will start ringing them. Um, we'll try ring in, we'll try emails, and then if we don't get any success of that, we're all literally going door knock um, to get people out and to come to the centre to see what we can do. Great. And this is obviously hash data for the purposes of the presentation, so you can't see the housing benefit reference number. But you can drill yeah. into this one household uh, of the 76. You can see that they're in council tax arrears, as we'd already filtered down to, that they're a lone parent. Um, you can load up that data into the benefit and budgeting calculator if you wanted to. So that'll take a second or two to load. But what that means is you don't need to input the information yourself, but you can just pull all, all of the information from the housing benefit record into a benefit calculation that helps to determine what steps they can take to be, to become better off, show what might be the difference of moving into work, possibly moving property, possibly making savings on your water bills or your um, or your you might qualify for a social tariff, for example. So I'll load up all the information for this household into into the benefit and budgeting calculator. Um, I just wanted to give one other quick example because uh, partly Julia, you mentioned at the end there the importance of showing return on investment. So I'm just going to show very briefly um, this ability to track residents. So if I click here into longitudinal cohort analysis, what you could do, uh, and I don't know the extent to which you've done this yet, Paul, but you could say those 76 households in Thornton Heath that you're working with, you could download their reference numbers, which yeah, I so did. So that's, that's the plan. So we, we tracked the ones in the Fieldway, New Addington. Obviously, we tracked the first 100 for the food stock. There's been great successes there. You know, 0% of government arrears now, more percentage-wise in employment. Um, so we are tracking them as, as we're going through. Great. And just to kind of show how that works for those uh, here, you can see that we went from 49,000. I just pasted those housing benefit reference numbers here. And then you can see those 76. They're obviously sort of, this is for a demo purpose, this, is, this isn't the 76 that you actually worked with, um, but it shows that how you can track their movements into and out of employment. Um, I selected those that are out of work today, so by definition that's where they ended up. Uh, you can also track changes in tenure, and I know, um, Julia, we worked with, with some of your uh, homelessness prevention teams to look at the impact of various homelessness prevention interventions. In actual fact, we looked at four and found that three were actually outperforming the fourth. 
uh, in one of the sort of pieces of analysis we did for, for Croydon Council. So you can start to show that you're making a, you're using the, the funding Gateway has available to it in a more effective way over time. I won't go into too much more detail there. And Paul, thanks so much for kind of walking through how you identify and work with a small group of households. And I just showed there a little bit about how you can track and show outcomes. I wanted to make sure that we um, flick back to the presentation and take a few more of your questions. So there are a couple Devin. here. Devin, yeah, sorry. sorry. I think it, it, it's, it, people should be aware as well that a lot of what we're doing in this is really cost avoidance rather than um, savings off baseline for any any budget. And sometimes the um, discussions that you've got to have within your own local authority are ones that really is um, get, getting that joint understanding of what the current situation is within your local authority and what the trajectory would be if you did nothing. And so therefore, once you've got that mapped out, that you're then able to show that through, through working in a different way, and for you being able to avoid costs, that what you are doing is, is that you are stopping the escalation of budgets. Um, the, uh, the, the way that you do the saving side is a bit more tricky, and that comes much more when you're working alongside social care and doing the interventions work alongside them. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's really helpful. So being able to track the trajectory of households um, those that you work with and those that you don't to say for those that you didn't work with this is what happened uh, and, and those that you did work with here's how the, the how, here's how the trajectory changed so you're not going to be successful in every case but you know you'll be more successful than if you didn't try at all um, really helpful there Julia there's quite a few questions now actually so I'm just going to run through them one by one and and, and hand over to um, uh, the three of you to sort of pick out there's one really interesting question here um, there's clearly a business case for prevention and the work that you do, but given funding changes by DWP, for example, um, CAB getting involved in universal universal support, um, uh, helped claim uh, as it's now called, and other changes to kind of I suppose the, the funding environment, but but mainly that. I mean, how how is that how is that sort of shift in DWP's focus toward CAB providing that initial support? Has that had any kind of impact? Has it been positive or or had no impact, or has it been has it made a bit of a difference to how you do things or, or the momentum you've got? Uh, okay, Paul, I'll, I'll pick part this up, Julia Mark, to add to it as well. So in terms of it, obviously, you know, the, the, you've got to remember the CAB contract isn't for the whole of the universal support, it's just the assisted digital side, so they're not offered any personal budget, budget and advice. And I would argue that was the, the more crucial bit to the actual universal support, because you can walk in any job centre up and down the country and there's staff there waiting to help with claim forms. So for me, they missed a trick. Um, again, I don't think they got out to the ground and really see, really understood what universal support was and how it's been used. Um, yeah. So that's the real for us. So we've had to keep staff doing it because for us, I think anyone that's a universal credit borrower will realise if you get universal credit right from day one, it's a much smoother transition, much transition and journey for them. So if you don't get it right from day one, that's when they're getting rent. Yeah. Um... It's really hard to backdate universal credit, etc., etc. So we. Job centres around the borrower still. Well, I think actually the follow-on question ties into that. So perhaps before Julia comes in, it's quite data focused. Um, the DWP haven't developed ADMS or LMS marker reports. I'm not sure what those stand for. So uh, if Kilsimer, you want to just uh, spell those out for me, I'll uh, say what they are, or Paul might know. But I think the point you make is is valid anyway, which is it's used by teams to help deliver the troubled families outcomes. I think underlying the question is, are you able to use the data that we work with, Paul, to support some of those troubled families as well? And do you sort of cross-check, verify the data from against the data you receive from DWP? Yeah, so uh, Matthew Biggs accordingly leads on that. So if anyone wants more information, they could contact Matthew Biggs direct as well. Um, so yeah, so we do link in heavily with him, obviously. It's more of a, uh, us feeding into them in terms of making sure that we sort of maximise the support for it. Um, obviously, it's still a little bit locked down in trouble families data, but we do feed into that process to make sure we're offering the support. And obviously, we've got a um, co-located JCP officer um, 
on our team as well, which helps with that sort of work as well. Great. I mean, I just want to add um, that there's a there's a follow on point there around universal credit data, and it's worthwhile saying that uh, in Croydon, I didn't show it in the demonstration, but we do have house uh, data on some of those households in receipt of universal credit, specifically those that are claiming council tax support. So that's about um, uh, typically around four, around sixty, around half, a little bit more than half of all households that you would have had data on anyway. So we're not losing all of it, but we are working with you, Julia in particular, around just supporting your lobbying work. We've actually got um, a small piece of work, as, as you say, um, Paul, you and I agree on kind of actually the data, you, you are allowed to ask for this data from DWP. And we're actually working with a barrister at the moment on getting a legal opinion around some of that. So sometimes I, I just think it's sort of a more of a risk averse culture, but if you read into the legislation, it's actually quite enabling and the data is there to help local authorities target support to vulnerable residents and it's about making that case to DWP in a way that they uh, that can make a difference um, so obviously putting that in, in the right kind of way I think you guys have already talked a bit about universal credit data I'm not sure if there was anything else um, to add to that point otherwise I'll move on to the next question yep move on to the next great um, are the team delivering prevention activities for the council or are you using third sector commission services to deliver the support and how does that sort of partnership work uh ha partnership working how does that partnership working work i guess um uh, and i think the underlying point they've just elaborated so sometimes external agencies are seen more able to deliver difficult advice because they're not in quote marks the council are you the bad guys so how have you worked <laughs> That's interesting. We're not the bad guys here. We're the good guys. Yeah. I think. Um, I think. Um, you're, I mean, I think that's a, a really good point, and something that I've really tried to work hard on with our image of Gateway and Gateway officers is that we are local authority officers, but our ethos is one that we do the right thing, and we're trying to help and helping people get to the place that they want to be. Um, which is a bit of a different ethos, perhaps, to, to what has gone before. Um, in terms of um, our partnerships, I think what we're doing within Croydon is um, an, a range of things. Um, so one of the, if you like, the, one of the biggest successes of the way that we work is that we work in partnership alongside the existing voluntary community sector organisations and faith sector organisations. Um, and this means that they're not actually necessarily commissioned by us or from Gateway Services indeed, but it's actually um, grassroots organisations have identified that there are issues where, whereby we could be seen as part of the solution and then we are invited in to work alongside them from their asset rather than us commissioning and there being a contractual relationship it is much more that we're equal partners. Um, we also do commission um, organisations to assist with um, early intervention and prevention agendas. Um, Gateway covers a range of um, if you like, areas, including um, street homelessness as well. And um, so for some of our services, yes, we do commission services. But a lot of what we do actually is in a different model and is one where we're working alongside our partners within the community, identifying issues that are common to um, them, to their local community and to us, and trying to see how by working together we can come up with solutions, um, if you like, and literally it is by pooling everything together. Yeah. Um... I mean that's fascinating. Just that, just that mention of equal partners. You don't always see that, and I think it's quite refreshing to hear uh, from a council, whether you're commissioning or not. I think that you can still sort of adjust that relationship a little bit, and also it means that you're making best use of not just the council's resources, but other resources that are out there as well, uh, which I think is a really strong part of the, the gateway approach. I should say it's 11:30. The challenge with not having a chair because of um, uh, some technical issues with, on Oscar's end is that we, we sort of hit the time, but I'm going to ask three more questions because there are three more questions on here. So, and we've still got quite a lot of people uh, on the call. So I'll, I'll ask them in, in one go. Uh, and for those of you that can stick around for another five, for another five minutes or so, I think it's 
uh, I'm really finding it fascinating. I think others are as well because the questions just just keep keep coming in. Uh, there's there's two here together around the data. Uh, the first one is are you are you bringing other data sets into the picture uh, beyond just the benefit ones? And what kind of resource does it take or do you use to kind of get the data or pull the data together? Okay, yeah, so in terms of different data sets, yeah, so we've got regular meetings and about just chatting about realistically what data sets we've got, the quality of the data in it, because I think the one thing with housing benefit data is, even though we're losing it, as you see, it's, it's still... really up to date in terms of contact detail, information we get, so that's a plus that we're still getting that information through. Um, and we are looking at other data sets, obviously social services, we're looking at um, Best Start, early help data sets, um, and we're just trying to see what we can use and bring it together and sort of work sensibly at. So again, we're just starting off a small pilot between in the north of the borough, again, for the people we're looking at our data and overlapping with Best Start and Early Start and actually seeing because we're working with both and we've got the GDPR consent side, we can share data and that's what we're trying to look at now, we're sensibly. Because you can put loads of data sets together and it don't actually produce anything relevant. <coughs> so it's best to look at small, what can we get from it and then try and learn from it and, and keep increasing that. In terms yeah. of data, we've got lucky here, we've got a real couple of really IT techie people that just put all the machine in, run some algorithms in the back and stuff and it comes, the, you know, comes up with the data. So for us, it's just we're quite blessed with people that are quite really good with uh, Excel. Yeah. The other thing to say, um, the, the, the resources and the, if you like, the amount to do it, again, as Paul, Paul touched on there, um, like what we're doing externally is the same ethos internally that we're trying to promote, is that we come together, we work together to actually, if you like, identify what the problem is, what the issues are, and then come up with the solution so that then we can then pull resources to actually get to the end objective. And of course, um, when we overlay data, um, so the existing data we have and say overlay early help data, what that's going to do is going to enable us to target some of those families who have um, problems, issues around, if you like, the foundations of their lives so that we're able to target them help them with those issues and then they will then be much in a much better position to actually um, interact with our children's social care colleagues. You know, I, I, I actually put it to a senior member of some, I said, if you were in the mire, you had problems and you were going to be evicted, you'd lost your job, you, you, you were struggling, you had four children and someone comes in and says to you, do you want to go to parenting classes? What would you do? And I, I, you know, I think, you know, we all have to think of that. What would you do? Would you, would your mind be so busy trying to deal with all the other issues? I think it would. So that's, the, that's why we have to try to sort out foundations of, of people's life first. So even with the data um, that we currently use in its raw sense that we've been using, I believe that is the big can opener of identifying some of the issues and trying to get solutions because when you look at um, many of the families and vulnerable adults hitting our services, um, when you dig deep, poverty is always at the, at the nub of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, just from a policy and practice perspective, briefly on the, on the, on the switch back to the data side, uh, we, uh, we've been involved, we've, we've helped a bit with some of your single view initiatives and Part of what the lift platform does is it pulls information around debt and support payments so you can see who's already getting help from the council what that help is and also which households are struggling at the moment and that's leading to um i think again helping you to pull some of that data together which you can download and, and sort of uh have your analysts work on too i mean it is your data at the end of the day which i think is a really big part of the principle of, of working with ourselves um there's one other final question uh, which is sort of joined again, but doing really good work with the most vulnerable. Are you doing any work with those who are coping or already in work? And, and if not you, is that happening across the council to make sure that you're being sort of extra preventative? Uh, so stopping people from getting into those situations where you're worried about getting them, them, them sort of becoming homeless? Yeah, 
help them help them to avoid that sort of risk of crisis point. Are you doing any of that extra early yeah. stage stuff or the resource is not quite there? Yeah, so in terms of the, obviously we've got an employment team here, um, and not only do we get people into work, we actually sort of maintain their employment as well. So I think last year around about 36 uh, residents we helped to maintain their employment, um, most of which were uh, mental health issues or disabilities. Um, again, that was in partnership with a fantastic company called APA that go in and offer sort of three months support. Um, and for us, it's sort of, you know, as part of the MJ, sort of what we sort of said, it's a, it's a branch, it's our network that's out and about, you know, it's the third sector, it's our community, it's our partners that we work with. So if they come across someone that is in it, really at the earliest stages of struggling, etc., that's where we get referrals in. So we are actually seeing some referrals now are saying that this person just about to creep into getting into a better place. Can you just have a conversation? And, and so it's, it's a really nice sort of, Nice emails and referrals to receive that we're actually now getting to help people that have not actually quite reached any sort of crisis or trouble. And that's obviously that's the that's the that's the end game, that's the dream really. So we're seeing pockets of it. The more we see that is even better. That, that's that's really helpful. I can see that we're starting to lose a few people now as we've gone as we've overrun a little bit, but those that did stick around uh, have really enjoyed uh, the extra time you've put in to answer those questions. So thank you to the three of you. Um, uh, there's a couple of other points around GDPR data which we'll follow up on it whether where there are extra questions just to let you know what the next steps are actually Anita was there anything you wanted to add in terms of the impact I wanted to give you an opportunity to sort of um, answer any of those questions that came through really yeah I mean I just think we were you know we're talking about the um, the joint working with the community and voluntary sector and faith sector but there's also a lot of good work with the private sector so we've been very lucky in terms of um, social value and And our contractors supporting um, our work as well in terms of fitting out our food stock shops and things like that and um, so that was our, our contractor Malali so we're obviously grateful for that support and also just in terms of the um, the Art Alliance and the partners um, where we're working together to you know provide added value and really support them look at other funding opportunities and we've been quite successful in that area as well um, you know looking at different avenues such as crowdfunding and getting people working together in partnership and bidding jointly and things like that so it's about the residents but it's also about community organizations as well I mean that that's absolutely brilliant uh, Julia was a master stroke master stroke be bringing Paul and Anita along I think that's driven a lot of the the Q&A so uh, well done to the, to the three of you thanks so much again for all of your time uh, another person we've worked with closely in Croydon is Jane who um, we worked with on a bid proposal and actually some of the data we were able to show around those that are in work helped helped I think helped her to be successful with an ESF bid so it can have positive positive impacts on the income side as well as on the partnership and cost prevention side. Um, some of the next steps, so I'm going to close down the webinar shortly uh, once I've said my goodbyes, but on the on the right hand side you can download the Croydon case study, you can download the Lyft dashboard flyer, you can download the Universal Credit Roadmap that I put up here uh, a little while ago, you saw earlier on the slides. We'll send a follow-up email uh, almost certainly today with this recording uh, slides and some of the links that might be relevant to you and you'll get an automatic uh, survey. We would really welcome your feedback. The next webinar is on the 10th of July, talking about how Curo Housing, who've been heavily involved in, uh, closely involved working with DWP on uh, supporting people on Universal Credit, how they triage support to help customers onto Universal Credit. You'll be able to register for that in the follow-on webinar. A huge thank you to Julia, Paul, and Anita. Do you want to say thank you and goodbye and have a last word, Julia? Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, thanks ever so much, everybody, for listening. And um, the offer's there. If any of you've got any um, further questions or you want more detail, do just drop me a line at obviously the email address there and we'll sort something for you. The other thing that we do a lot of is um, I've, I've hosted many a visit from many organisations and local authorities, housing associations and others um, to come and see some of the work that we're doing and the model that we have here. Again, um, the offer is there. If you want to take that up on that opportunity, um, please do get in touch and um, you're more than willing to come along and spend a day, half a day, whatever you'd like um, to learn more about what we're doing and to see it on the ground in reality. Great, and similarly policy and practice too. So if you're doing interesting work, we're always interested to see some of that and perhaps showcase it on a, on a future webinar. So we look forward to 
keeping in touch. It's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, on the webinar, Julia. Thanks so much for coming along. I feel massively energized for the rest of the day and to continue <laughs> working with you. So thanks all, all so much. I'm going to close down the webinar now. Uh, and um, thanks so much. <laughs>